Good morning, everyone. How's it going? Awesome. So you're here to, to learn a little bit about code quality, specifically naming. This is something I'm pretty passionate and excited about. And naming is just one small aspect of code quality. It's focused on the readability of your code. So of course, first, welcome to Stir Trek. Thanks for showing up bright and early <laughs> to the first session. I'm really excited about today, and uh, those seats are amazing. So how many people have been here for their first time at Stir Trek today? Awesome. Congratulations, mine too. We'll get through this together. I do have the Slack channel up on my screen so that I can see what you type if you're not in the main room. So I will do my best to follow along with that as I ask questions. This is a very interactive session. I'm going to ask a lot of questions and basically look for some popcorn responses. Just shout it out. Don't raise your hand. Don't worry about it. If I see stuff on the Slack channel, I'll make sure to yell those out as well. And if you have any questions at any point, if I can't get to them through the talk, I will be sure to answer them before the end of the day. So recently, I was reintroduced to the concept of naming. I was going through this little bit of code and trying to figure out what it was doing. And so I'm going through the debugger, I'm adding comments, I'm taking notes, and just kind of generally muddling through a chaotic mess of trying to understand this code so that I could fix it. And around that same time, I was reintroduced to this famous quote by the late Phil Carlton, who was an, net, an architect in Netscape in the early years of the internet. And that made its way across my desk, and the quote is this. There are only two hard things in computer science, cache and validation and naming things. Of course, I was thinking that was pretty true, but we're programmers. What do we have to do? We have to one-up each other, right? So Leon Van Brick expanded on this with this gem. There are two hard problems in computer science, cache and validation, naming things, and off by one errors. Of course, naming is hard. We all know this. In fact, I'm not going to ask for a show of hands because uh, that would be rude. But my guess is that most of you at some point in your career have spent longer naming a function than you spent implementing it. Right? So to illustrate this concept, I would like to walk you through a little game that I've been known to play at conferences in the past. Uh, you take turns. You're sitting around with some friends, whatever, having a drink, eating dinner. Take turns coming up with a noun. And then see if that noun exists as an NPM package. OK? Here's the first three words that I tried when I was putting the slide together. Aardvark. It's an NPM package. Lemon. Yep, there's an NPM package for that. Sneaker? Totally. Sneaker.js, there's an NPM package for that. In fact, and here's the crazy part of this, when I put the slide deck together and I looked these up, every one of those was active within the last seven days. It's very hard sometimes to come up with good names, creative names, different names, unique names, if you were going to name a new NPM package today, good luck finding one that's not already used, right? So this illustrates how hard naming can be for us. And all of these are just taking advantage of some random word that already exists. And as much as this talk isn't going to cover public names, things like brands and NPM package names, it does emphasize the problem a little bit. So we're going to be talking more about how to name things in your code to make your code more readable. So why do we care about this? Well, for one thing, developers tend to switch jobs pretty often. Um, the average turnover in our profession is about two years. And the turnover rate at four years is so high, it's practically the upper limit of how long you're going to work at any one position. You add to this the fact that companies are hiring more developers all the time. Um, we hire contractors. We're constantly onboarding and bringing people onto our teams. So 
if we make it challenging for them to read and understand the existing code that we already have when they join the company or the team, we've really reduced their ability to be productive quickly. Another thing that we want to avoid is bugs, right? And the easier your code is to read and understand, the easier it is to avoid bugs, the easier it is to test your code, and accessibility. One of the things about really important naming that we're gonna get into is semantics. It is making sure that something that you write does what it says it does and has a specific meaning. This is a core concept in web accessibility. And we're gonna talk about that in a minute. And finally, automation. If you have consistent, good, predictable quality naming, it makes it a lot easier for you to write automation around that. So before we get any further, let me quickly introduce myself. My name is Michael Dowden. I have been working in tech for about 24 years in a variety of industries. Um, I've done a lot of consulting. I've worked for some startups. And I primarily code in Java and in JavaScript, but do a few other things as well. Um, right now, I am the founder of a couple startups. Uh, Andromeda has some fun projects, including FlexiPark which is a mobile, parking, mobile web parking application, and we also do consulting services in accessibility, uh, UI, and UX design. So here's the part where I'm gonna expect some feedback from you. Where do you spend your time as a developer? I'll give you an example. Writing code. What are some other things you do as a developer? Time yes, timesheets. What else? Searching. Searching. Anything else? Code reviews? Code reviews? Documentation. Documentation, reading code, stand-ups, stand <laughs> meetings, testing. testing, all these things. Out of all those things that we just mentioned, a lot of them involve reading code. How many of them involve writing code? One. Okay. So hopefully we're ready for this. Uh, some of you may have actually met Uncle Bob, uh, Robert Martin who wrote, the ratio of time spent reading code to writing code is easily 10 to 1. We are constantly reading old code as part of the effort to write new code. Therefore, making code easier to read makes it easier to write. So when we talk about naming, what are we talking about? What is it that makes up a name? What are the components of a name? How do we judge a name? How do we know if a name is good or bad? Semantics. This is the branch of linguistics and logic concerned with meaning. In code, this refers to choosing the right word and structure to convey the intended meaning in your code. This is critical for accessibility. For example, in HTML, if you simply use a div instead of using perhaps a nav tag or a UL or a table, you are not conveying meaning or intent with that block of text or content. That means that if you want to implement good accessibility, guess what? You have to now do some crazy things to get around that fact that you admitted that. You have to add some ARIA. Um, you have to add some CSS. You've got to do things to get a certain behavior and expectation that should have been there from the beginning. And it's really important because if you have a screen reader or some sort of automation technology and you have not correctly conveyed what you intended to do with this, the technology doesn't know what to do with it either. The browser doesn't know how to render it. The screen reader doesn't know how to present it to someone verbally. Part of the naming is vocabulary. This is the words, the words that we use are only particularly meaningful if they exist within the vocabulary of our problem domain, if the person reading them later understands what they mean. Uh, everybody works within context of specific vocabularies. Um, I'm gonna get into that a little bit more in a minute. Intent, what do you intend to do? What is the purpose of this thing? Why does it exist? That is slightly different from semantics. Um, intent includes within it how you expect something to be used. So for example, the intent of a function. 
when should I expect to call this function, or um, when should I expect to use this class that I see in my, in my code? Those are concepts of intent. And then finally, disambiguation. It is perfectly possible to write a function name or a variable name that definitely describes what's going on, but could potentially mean one of a couple different things. So we need to make sure that go a good name is not ambiguous, shouldn't be confusing. It should be readily obvious which intent or which purpose was, was meant by that word. So anytime we're writing code, we have some specific design goals that we follow. These are implicit. We kind of don't talk about this. This probably doesn't show up in any of your use cases or any of your project documentation. One, the project does what it's supposed to do. The program does what it's supposed to do when you're done with it. That's an implicit goal without bugs. It's usually an implicit goal. Without security vulnerabilities, sometimes that's specific. What are some other goals that we have when we're writing code that are kind of implicit goals? Yep. Yep, performance is a great one. Yes. Those are all excellent. Should be easy to use, right? User experience is often a, a goal, either implicit or explicit. So the purpose for our naming rules that we're gonna cover is to help optimize our code for clarity. From structured interpretation, programs must be written for people to read and only incidentally for machines to execute. One of the goals we just discussed actually involves running the code of the computer, of course, versus some of the other things we've talked about that are more user focused, right? So I used the daily WTF very extensively in putting this talk together because, hey, lots of free, really bad code for, to pull down, right? Who knows what that does? Anyone? <laughs> You're all staring at it. It's not obvious. Lots of these different conversions up there, they appear unnecessary. They don't give it, the, the names that are used don't give us any indication of what's really going on with that bit of code. And there's a huge cognitive load there in trying to figure that out. We've gotta be aware of that when we're writing code that the next person to come along is gonna have this huge challenge to try and figure out what we were meant to do. Um, that's very expensive for us long, long term and it's not very effective if we spend four hours reading through a block of code just so that we can make one little tiny change to it. All right, so ambiguity. We talked about disambiguation as a part of a good name. Ambiguity refers to any word or phrase for which a single cohesive concept cannot be identified. I'm gonna give you a couple examples. There. 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 Do you know what I meant when I say there? Obviously this verbal answer it doesn't work very well when we're writing. I guess on the internet that still works pretty well. Uh, two. 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 What I mean. But there's, there's lots of, there's three different things I could mean when I say two, and we use context to figure it out, but you can't just use the thing that I said to immediately identify it. Same thing happens in written language all the time, especially in English. We have all kinds of ambiguity in our language. So we need to be very careful about that. So here's another example of ambiguity. What do I mean if I say something is free? Anyone? It costs nothing. What do I mean if I say software is free? <laughs> Any open source people out here? Yeah. It can mean that it's free of cost. 
but it can also mean that it's free to use, as in freedom, as in I could do with it anything that I want, whatever I like. And those are two very different concepts. They're both very important. They can both be things that I mean when I say a piece of software is free. Some software is, some free software is both. It's both free to use however I want and free of cost. Others are not. Sometimes it's one, sometimes it's the other. So we have to watch words like that um, and the ambiguity around it. So speaking of ambiguity, here is a really interesting quote. This came out in a memo from Elon Musk uh, regarding SpaceX, and I'm just going to read part of it, the relevant part here for today. Excessive use of acronyms is a significant impediment to communication, and keeping communication good as we grow is incredibly important. Individually, a few acronyms here and there may not seem so bad, but if a thousand people are making these up over time, the result will be a huge glossary that we have to issue to new employees. No one will actually remember all these ac acronyms, and so people are going to sit in ignorance, seem dumb in a meeting, but they don't want to seem dumb, so they're not going to ask the question. They're just going to sit there, and this is really tough on new employees. The key test for an acronym is to test whether it helps or hurts communication. Uh, as a good rule, an acronym that most engineers already know within the industry is fine. And so that was the guideline for SpaceX on when to use an acronym because they can be really confusing and or ambiguous. So if you don't believe me, we're going to play a little game. I'm going to pull up an acronym and I want you to, to type or shout out what you think that acronym means. And I think the first one, if you've been on Twitter at all in the last week, is going to get your attention. or in my honest opinion, apparently, is a very big debate. <laughs> yes, content management system, or Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services. So I once worked on a content management system called .CMS for Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services. We had CMS flying around all over the place, and nobody knew what, was ta what we were talking about. <laughs> or, in the wrong context, just see ya. Or do over again. Sure. It's also a truck, an animal, a brewery. Yes, Great Britain, Green Bay, what, gigabyte? Oh, uh, was that 1,000 megabits or 1024? Quality time. Oh, my word, yeah, on my way, oh, my word. End of day. Or, end of document, end of discussion. Strength, street, saint, Star Trek, Star Trek. <laughs> there are actually 34 Wikipedia entries on the disambiguation page for ST. Clearly, that doesn't mean anything out of context, right? We have to have context and even have any idea what it means. So let's talk about how names affect our architecture for a minute. The names you choose for variables, methods, classes can provide a very good indication of the status of your overall architecture. Good names are a good indicator of clear, elegant code, while bad names are usually a symptom of how we're struggling to make sense of the mess we're dealing with as we're putting something together. So here's a quote from Steve McConnell, author of Code Complete. Good code is its own best documentation. As you're about to add a comment, ask yourself, how can I improve the code so this comment isn't needed? Make that improvement, and then document the code anyway to make it impossible to misunderstand, right? 
Here's a great counterexample, and again from the daily WTF. This is an example of code that is too verbose. We've got variable names here that extend beyond the length of the page, but they still don't mean anything. Do the same change in inventory. Do the same change as what? <laughs> same as what? Does that tell me anything? Not really. It requires a lot of context still, so now we have something that's both very verbose and very confusing. That's not helpful. So we don't necessarily want to write our things like that. That is not what we mean by documenting in our code. <laughs> Another example. What does this code do? So if you see a variable called not result, you should probably ask yourself what you're doing wrong. It's actually storing the negation of the test so that it returns the opposite of the negation of the test. That's really hard to read. And general Boolean negatives are a lot harder to read than Boolean positives. And any time you find yourself negating something multiple times, you're adding to the confusion. And when part of the negation is actually in the name of the variable, stop. Find a way to clean that up and make that simpler and easier to read. So again, from the daily WTF, this is an example of a side effect of a rule intended to improve the, code of, the quality of some code. Can anybody tell me what that rule was from looking at this simple example? Function length. The rule was approximately, function should be no longer than 500 lines. So what does the very next developer to enter this 1500 line function do? Well, that's fine. I'll create a function that returns three other functions that reach only 500 lines in length. Problem solved. That actually makes the code harder to read, not easier, because now I've got to go to three completely different places, and potentially that's changed some of the interactions in that code. It's potentially introduced bugs, and it has not made the code any easier to read. So when we introduce rules, on how we can make improvements to our code, we need to be very careful that the expedient thing to do doesn't actually make the code worse. Here's another case uh, where the variable names are an indication of a problem. What is up with S1 and S2 bouncing back and forth up there? Um, I mean, at least they could have just used one variable and at least used it consistently all the way down. That wouldn't have changed anything. Bouncing back and forth, there's no point in that. But it's a great indication when you see something like that, hey, that doesn't feel quite right. It's probably not. Let's think about how we designed our entire approach to this method and solve that. And the names there, actually great indicators. Anytime you find that you have to put a number, a numeric indicator after your name, stop and think about it. Is that number actually conveying meaning to the variable or, or method or class? Is the number actually part of the meaning? Or is it just there because, well, I had tests, and now I've got test one, and now I've got test two because I'm running out of things because I'm doing all this crazy stuff, and stop and think about our approach overall. So ephemeral means temporary or for a limited time. A lot of the code we write is temporary. Uh, this is the fundamental component of agile development, right? It's the understanding that code changes. The requirements change, things change, and we need to be able to do that very quickly and efficiently. If you work in a startup, you're probably gonna write and throw away code all the time. That's just part of the game. Even in the corporate environment, actually sometimes we see the opposite, right? We write something that was intended to be used for only short period of time, and 10 years later, we find that it's still there. Um, we don't always know when we write something, is it gonna be there a short period of time or a long period of time? And so it's very important that our names kind of reflect that a little bit. So let's look at an example. You're working on a UI for a website. 
The marketing team hands you the branding colors. You've got this color palette you can use. You're going to build a website from this. Boom, there's a website. You have the CSS for your colors. Orange, blue, green. Sweet. But now the marketing team decides to update the secondary colors. Now you need to make that change to the website. Hey, no problem, man. It's just hex codes. Make a couple changes. Website looks different. Everybody's happy. And, uh, <clears throat> whoops. Right, because those, those class names existed in 100 places all over my HTML. I'm not going to go through and fix that. Why bother? It's already there. So here's an extreme example. It's really silly, of course. I rolled the die to come up with that number. It is totally random, I promise. Also not helpful at all. And doesn't actually do what, the, what we would assume that it does based upon reading that method name. We're assuming that we're getting a random number every time, not a random number that was generated exactly once. So, in my example, when I started this talk, I was going over a bit of code trying to understand that. How often do you do this? Or, how often do you look at a bit of code, oh, that's easy, I understand what it does, and then you run it and you realize it does something completely different. Anyone? Yeah, totally. Or, when you're coming in to work on a bit of code, you feel the need to add about 10,000 lines of comments so that you can figure it out again <laughs> the next time you come in. Have you done that? Okay? And it's, 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 these are techniques that we use to try and muddle through code that we don't understand. So when we refactor, well, refactoring is, of course, the idea of, of improving the code over time, right? Um, I th yeah, so let's talk about this, this quote here. This is Martin Fowler, and he has this really wonderful quote, any fool can write code that a computer can understand. Good programmers write code that people can understand. So let's use another example. And I like using CSS as an example because it's really easy to create visuals around it. Same thing applies to your code. So we have this write class. Let's talk about write class for a minute. So if you were to pull in a CSS framework, there's like a 90% chance it's going to have a dot write class defined somewhere. The, the interesting part about that, though, is that there's only a 50% chance it's going to be implemented like that. There is another 50% chance that it's going to be implemented as a float write. These mean two completely different things, which is an indicator that perhaps write is a terrible name, because it doesn't actually tell us what we're moving to the right, how we're moving something to the right. But let's, let's use this in, a, in an example. We've got these columns of numbers. Numbers, we like them to the right. But now that I've got this class right, I've also got this other thing. I want to provide a numeric indicator of how many characters you've typed in this text field. I already have this class. It'll shove that thing to the right. Problem solved, no big deal. Which is all well and good until I decide that I want to add some styling around that numeric indicator. So I give it some styling. Change the, make it gray, make it so it's not the most obvious thing on the page. Add, space it out a little bit. Looks great, no big deal. Commit. Except that I wasn't even looking at this other page where that right class was being used to move numbers to the right column, and now those numbers look weird. I don't want those to be gray. I want them to be visible. So by reusing an existing class that had a bad name, I have caused problems and introduced bugs. It's really simple. Just use a better name. 
numeric column. Still all it does right now is text line to the right. But now we have a name that indicates what we're doing and why. I want to format a numeric column. Perfect. Or perhaps in this case, I want a character counter. So there's semantic meaning and intent behind those names. And it means that as I add styling here, I have a high degree of confidence that however I make it look here, it's going to work every other time I'm using this class because I'm using it in a consistent way because it has a consistent meaning. Another big part of code quality, and this is a tough one sometimes for people, but it's, it's typos and misspellings. And let's talk about that for a minute. Why is that important? Anyone want to take a stab? Yes, you're searching through the code. You're trying to find every use of something. But in some cases, it has been misspelled. We can't find it. It doesn't show up. Therefore, we make the changes to what we find and introduce all kinds of bugs and problems. Uh, I have run into code bases. This is an extreme example, but I have run into code bases where the same word was spelled like five or six different ways because of the number of typos and misspellings that were used. It makes it very, very challenging to do refactoring long term. <clears throat> so how much thought do you give to the names you use for classes, variables, functions, files, et cetera? Do you have any techniques that you use today to work through that? Do you have a thought process behind that? Anyone? Yes. That's a great one. The thesaurus.com. Anyone else? Are there any rules that we could follow to try and avoid some of the pitfalls? I'm going to talk about some of these. XKCD, anyone? Love it. This guy's trying to, to enter a host name for a server. He's been, you've been staring at that screen for a while. Hey, picking a good server name is important. And yet you settled on Caroline for our daughter in like 15 seconds. But this is a server! <clears throat> so we all know what naming is hard. And I think that we understand that it's important, but what can we do about it? So Eagleson's Law has been floating around for decades. Nobody actually knows who originated this quote. But the law is this. Any code of your own that you haven't looked at for six or more months might as well have been written by somebody else. So one of the excuses that I hear a lot of times for kind of mediocre code quality is, eh, it's just me working on this. It's no big deal. I've been here for five years. I'll be here for five more years. Nobody else has ever touched this code. It doesn't matter. Well, actually it does because of this. <clears throat> so let's go into some tips about what we can do to improve our code quality over time. And then we'll have probably a little bit of time for some discussion and ideas. Your audience, the people involved. The next person to touch this code is more than likely going to be a developer who does not have in their head the context, the discussions, the information that you had in your head at the time you wrote the code in the first place, even if it's you. So it's really important that if we wrote a block of code in a specific way, because we had 32 meetings about it, trying to figure out the correct approach, it's really important that we document that somewhere. And it's just as important that we document that somewhere that the next developer can find it easily. The best place to do that, a lot of times, is in the code itself, in a code comment, or in some sort of readme file or other documentation that is in the same repository as the code. Make it easy for the next person to find the answers that they're looking for without having the same 32 meetings before they can make a change to that code.
the names you write should be specific and written within the language of your problem domain. So the problem domain and the vocabulary issue is an interesting one because let's use, use banking, for example. Banking and insurance use a lot of the same words, right? They're both kind of in the financial industry as a whole. And so we could generally assume that when we hear words in one industry versus the other, that they would mean similar things. A lot of times, though, that's not the case. I worked uh, a couple years ago for an insurance company that had banks as clients. And you wouldn't believe the number of times that there was just complete misunderstanding because they had the same vocabulary, but completely different intents for that. <clears throat> so making sure that the things you talk about are written within the domain of vocabulary. If you switch a team, how many times have you joined a new team, for example, only to find out that they talk about things a little bit differently? So maybe you've got a, you do agile, and somebody's it's somebody's responsibility to go in and make sure that the stories are prepared and ready for developers to start working on them. What is that process called? Anyone? Refinement, grooming, requirement, requirement yep. Yeah. Anything else? Every team I've been on uses a different word for that. Every single one. So there's lots of things like that. There's lots of times we join a team use words we've always been using and nobody understands what we're talking about. Or other people are talking about these activities, we're like, what does that mean? And you, you get into the bottom of it and you realize, oh, I understand what that means. It's the same thing I did in my last team. We just call it something different now. <clears throat> so being specific is important. Um, worked on a gaming app. We had the word class because you had characters that were members of a class. But class is a concept inside the code. So now, the problem domain and the code domain have overlapping vocabulary. Or maybe you've got characters in this game that have a level. And they can cast spells that also have a level. Two completely different meanings of the word level in that context. So we need to add something else. So for example, tax. How many different types of, types of tax do we pay in a given year? So having, a, a, having that as a name isn't really telling me anything, right? QTY, even if I am willing to grant you that I always know that QTY means quantity, quantity of what, right? And so the specificity of your names is important. Functions and methods should contain a verb. Otherwise, what I'm really doing is saying, here is what this thing is operating on, but not what kind of operation it's doing. And now this is a little bit different from the kinds of things we, we talk about in RESTful services, where your endpoints are supposed to be the noun, the thing you're operating on, and then we apply HTTP verbs to it to describe how we're changing it. But in our code, we've got to have the verb right there. Sales tax, great, what am I doing it? Am I retrieving it? Am I storing it somewhere? Am I calculating it? I don't know what that means unless I add another, uh, add a verb to the front of that. Order quantity, in fact, is a really bad one because order can be a verb, right? So my, if I call this function, am I ordering a quantity of something? Am I fetching the order quantity of something? Et cetera. Use the full word. And as much as possible, avoid abbreviations and crazy, clever workarounds. How many people have seen class with Zs? Yes. Um, this is a, there's a lot of crazy workarounds people do when dealing with CSS classes. 
because class is a reserved word in almost every single language. Uh, but consistency can be important here too. So in the Java world, um, Apache Commons is probably the most commonly used Java library since the beginning of time. They solve that problem in at least three different ways. Class with the Z's, class with a K, and then class name, or class names. It's the same library. <clears throat> and quite frankly, there's no need for that because CSS classes, either it's a class name, it's the name of the class, fine, done, I've solved that problem, or potentially, consider this, CSS, when you use the, the, the class keyword in an HTML tag, how many classes can you put in there? As many as you want, space delimited, right? It's actually technically a list of classes, so class list would be another great way to, to call that, or classes, problem solved. So we don't, when we find ourselves trying to come up with really clever, cutesy ways to get around naming collision problems, it probably means our name sucks in the first place. And we should come up with a better alternative, something that conveys even more meaning than the word we were going to use. And of course, the, the full word thing, it avoids the acronyms, abbreviations, and initialisms. It's important for a couple of reasons. First, it improves the specificity, the clarity, it reduces ambiguity, but just as importantly, it means when I am searching through the code, I can find it. Because if we use abbreviations, sometimes and not always, or heaven forbid we use multiple different abbreviations to refer to the same basic word or concept, it makes it impossible to search through the code later and figure out where all the instances of that thing are. And we've already kind of talked about spell check, spelling a little bit as an issue, so use a spell check. Include spell checking as part of your code reviews. Um, two famous examples of misspellings. Who here has ever written in C? Yep, a bunch of us, okay? Create? It really means create, uh, but somebody just decided to leave the E off and it made it into the language spec for decades. Whoops. But probably the most long-standing and nefarious misspelling of all time is referrer, which made it into the original HTML spec with only one R, which is clearly wrong, because referrer has two R's in the middle. Uh, but it made it into the spec, which at this point in time, how many applications, application servers, web servers, have been written with the wrong spelling? We literally can't change it anymore. It's not possible. We can't fix that problem now. So particularly when you're dealing with public-facing APIs, check your spelling. This is actually really important because it's really hard to get something right when you've got to target something that is spelled wrong in a public endpoint. Comments. So comments are actually a really important part of code quality, and they can be tied to the naming concept a little bit. So when you're writing comments, they should explain why or how. They should provide the context. They shouldn't explain what the code is doing, because the code tells what the code is doing. If you have to write a comment to explain what the code is doing, fix the code and make that more obvious and clearer. What we really need to understand are the things we cannot embed in the source code itself, and that is, why did I implement it like this, especially if it looks really weird in this context? One of the things that I see a lot of times is comments that are effectively pseudocode for the code that comes right underneath it. We duplicate the code, we write it twice. And this is often a side effect of, of rules saying, thou shalt comment thy code, 
right? And we can actually, that's something that can be built into check-ins. We can automate this process to require that we add comments sufficiently to our code. But if we require quantity of comments, a lot of times it reduces the quality of them. We don't know what else to do, so we just type the same thing twice. Two slashes in front of one line and we're good. It solves one problem without solving the other. Don't include the implementation details in the name. We talked about this a little bit when we went over some of those CSS examples, right? Um, write is an implementation detail. The fact that we're moving something to the right isn't the purpose of the thing. The purpose of the thing is to format a num numeric column, for example. Um, it, when you include the data type in a name, I guess sometimes that could make sense, um, but not always. And it's certainly redundant because unless you're like literally using Notepad to write your code, you probably have an editor that's telling you what data type something is as you're working in it. It doesn't enhance the meaning or intent in any way, shape, or form. And quite frankly, if I look at something that says first name, I'm pretty sure that's not a number. And another type of thing that we see a lot actually is like format date, Y, 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 M, M, D, D. Well, that's how you're formatting it right now. What happens when I decide that the short date format that we use in our application needs to change? Maybe I want MMDDYY, DDMMYY, whatever. There's lots of different short date formats out there. So let's call it a format short date. And I can return any format I want from that, and it's never going to affect the name. The name is always going to mean the same thing. It's not ephemeral. It's specific. If my code really, really cares about that format to that extent, we need to ask why we're using that here and maybe think about different architectural decisions, right? Because we can use these naming as kind of indicators of how we've gone through and made decisions about the architecture of our code. Any questions about any of this at this point? Comments, feedback? <clears throat> namespacing. Um, we often use namespacing. This can be database table in SQL. This can be a class name in Java. This can be parent object in JSON. Um, but make sure that your namespacing really is, is meaningful and consistent and gets you far enough to the, your goal, right? Business.state, what's wrong with business.state as, as a name? Why is it, it is ambiguous, why is it ambiguous? Yes, correct. What is the current state of the business? Is it active, delinquent, suspended, terminated, right? What else could it mean? Location, what state they are headquartered in. Indiana, Ohio, whatever. So we need to make sure that we have enough of a namespace there to truly tell us what that name means or the, the localized name. We either need to be like, this is location state in some way or we need to add more namespacing to make sure that, that is, we achieve that same goal. Using namespacing to give you a call to the name is fine. Sometimes it's still dangerous though, right? Because if, I've, if I'm depending on namespacing in this way, we need to be careful because sometimes I'm literally just gonna have the name state. State doesn't tell me a whole lot by itself. And total can be the same way. What am I totaling? I need some context for that. I know what a total is, but I need to know more. And the namespacing can, is one great technique to enhance the quality of our names. So who does code reviews? Good, excellent, about 50, 60%. 
one of the best ways to start making improvements to your code base to implement some of these naming rules, for example, to try and come up with better names, is to create a code review checklist that you'll follow. And again, I like the code review checklist concept for a lot of these a lot better than I like to automate some of these rules into a build process. And I think we've explored some of the reasons why. Because when you have rules that you have to follow exactly, precisely to the letter, you end up with stupid comments. You end up with people breaking up a, a single function into three functions that are harder to read. So adding this as a code review process, in my opinion, is one of the best ways to implement some improvements. And naming is really hard to write automated checks around, right? This is something that we as a team need to agree upon. Create a, vo a, a glossary. What is your team vocabulary? Um, even better, the industry you're working in. There's probably already published vocabularies for that industry. The insurance industry, for example, has published glossaries. What do these different terms mean in a way that we can, from company to company within the same industry, when we refer to a specific calculation or value, we understand that we're doing it the same way, that it means the same thing. And a lot of industries will have something like this. So if you can refer to some specific industry documentation, even better. And that will help you with consistency, not only in your team, but improve your ability to work with other partners outside of your own company. So. Last year, I wrote a blog post about code reviews. It's right there. If you want to read it and talk about it, I love code reviews as well. I think this is a really important thing for us to do as developers. Uh, and so I would be more than happy to talk about that more later. And that is it. I'm just a few minutes early. So if you have any questions, either here in person or on Slack, I will answer them now. Yes. Okay. E commerce platform with a table of orders. I guess that kind of depends. Um, I have had order tables before. And one of, the, one of the biggest arguments we'll get into, right, is should it have an S on the end, right? Um, order is probably okay in that context. Right. So one of the things you might do there is customer orders. If it's just order, singular, one of the problems with that is not only is that a, a, a keyword, it's a keyword in SQL, and Order can mean sequencing, or it can mean purchasing something. So you're probably OK, because you have the context of the fact that you're working on an e-commerce platform. So orders make sense as a table name. But you, you, you can, there, there's lots of, and this is why we can make ourselves crazy, right? This is why I know I personally have spent more time coming up with names for functions than I have spent implementing them. But. All right, thank you very much. That's it. I will stick around for a few minutes to answer questions, and I will follow up on Slack later if there's any questions out there. Thank you very much.